Hello everyone! In my last video on post-processing, I went over a very simple color corrector, but when you begin to add more effects to your game, it can get quite confusing as to how these effects interact with each other and what order they come in. Other games seem to have it figured out quite well, so how do modern AAA games handle their post-processing pipelines? It turns out the answer is pretty simple. Post-processing effects come in the order that they would come in in the real world. In real life, you have an environment that you want to take a picture of with a camera, then you have the photo the camera took, and then you have the editing software you're using to change the photo. With this model, we can determine that post-processing effects that have an effect on the environment come first. These are effects like screen space ambient occlusion, screen space reflections, or fog. Next comes post-processing effects that simulate camera properties such as bloom, chromatic aberration, or film grain. Lastly comes effects that are most commonly referred to as post-processing effects, such as color correction. So far out of all my videos, I've talked about fog, color correction, and bloom. To order these effects properly, fog comes first since it simulates a part of the environment. Bloom comes next since it simulates the effect of light overwhelming a camera lens, and lastly comes color correction, because that's what you would do in Photoshop. Speaking of color correction, I have a few more effects to teach you, starting with exposure. Exposure is as simple as multiplying our color by an exposure value. Since it's a camera-related effect, we want to put it in between bloom and contrast. Next up we have white balancing. It's kind of complicated math-wise, but white balancing Balancing is defined by two parameters, temperature and tint. The temperature value will make the color cooler or warmer, and the tint value tweaks the color that gets temperature shifted. White balancing allows you to visually convey the temperature of your scene. For instance, if I make the colors warmer, then my grass field looks like it could be summertime, whereas if I make it cooler, then it could be nighttime or winter. Lastly, we have color filtering, which is achieved by multiplying our color with any other color. Obviously, this tints the render towards whatever color we filter by, but the most impactful aspect of the effect is that all whites of the screen will become the same color as the color filter. In my last video, I was rather adamant about you keeping your colors in the 0 to 1 range. This is because colors that are displayed on your screen are 8 bits each and can only visualize colors in the range of 0 to 1. But if we look at the texture format in Unity, we can actually see that we have 16 bits per pixel available to us until the last frame, which clamps to these 8 bits. Colors that exceed 1 are said to be in high dynamic range, but since our computers can only display colors in low dynamic range, we need to get our high dynamic range colors into the 0 to 1 range. Tone mapping is the act of mapping high dynamic range colors into the low dynamic range. But but in order to tone map, we need high dynamic range colors, so we need to remove our limiters. The simplest tone mapper is no tone mapper, also known as RGB clamping. If any color exceeds 1, we clamp it to 1 and move on with our day. This is obviously not optimal for several reasons. Brighter colors lose their hue and are clamped to white, and bright areas lose almost all of their detail. This problem isn't new, in fact the first major tone mapping operator comes from 1993 when we were still using CRTs. The Tumblin Rushmire Tone Mapper works by taking the average luminance of the image and a maximum allowed contrast, and then compresses the colors down. This significantly increases the contrast between high and low values to really accentuate the range of luminance, and it has built-in auto exposure since it is dependent on the average luminance of the image. Tumblin Rushmire Tone Mapping remained the most popular tone mapper until 2002 when Reinhard came in and said, why are you guys doing all this expensive math? You could just use this simple equation to scale all of the colors down to 0 to 1 based on the average luminance. Then everyone told him why that solution sucked, and it's because if you use the tone mapper on a low dynamic range, then the maximum possible luminance is 0.5 instead of 1.0, which, 
isn't very great. Reinhardt came back and said, wait, wait, I swear I have something of value to add. And then he presented his Reinhardt extended tone mapper. which takes this fault into account by defining a white point, which is the color value that corresponds to white. This is generally the value of the brightest color on the screen. Reinhardt Extended became the new standard tone mapper as it did a much better job at preserving the detail of high luminance areas than Tumblin Rushmire. As you can see here, the detail of the star model can actually be seen with Reinhardt Extended. Eight years later, Naughty Dog came up with their own tone mapper for Uncharted 2, which was based on filmic tone mappers that operate on color instead of luminance, and the overall industry shifted to utilizing filmic curves due to their appealing results and similarity to cinema. This leads us to today, where the industry standard tone mapper is ACES. Pretty much every AAA game uses it, and it is the default curve in Unreal Engine. ACES stands for Academy Color Encoding System, and it's quite nice because it's drag and drop and generally looks good. At the moment, there are two main versions of ACES. The Hill ACES, which is computationally complex, but is the complete ACES tone mapping, and Narcowix ACES, which is a faster approximation of the original curve. They are visually distinct. Hill ACES is much darker than Narcowix. Whatever tone mapper you decide to use is up to you. I went through all of the popular tone mappers from 1993 to now, and ironically, my favorite is the original Tumblin Rushmire operator. I really like the exaggerated contrast of the scene and the built-in auto exposure. In terms of the post-processing pipeline, Tone mapping comes at the very end, just before gamma correction, as gamma correction operates on low dynamic range values only. If you would like to try out a variety of tone mappers, my script for testing all of these is available in the description, but don't feel pressured to use a tone mapper. Your game doesn't actually need HDR, there's plenty of great games that exist entirely in the low dynamic range, such as Breath of the Wild. If there's any post-processing effects you'd like me to talk about, please let me know, because I have no idea what I'm going to talk about next. But until then, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.